talk is how to scratch an itch in 200 repos or less. Uh, this is a keynote talk, and all that really means for any of us here is that I'm really nervous. Uh, 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 but you can uh, uh, hopefully help calm my nerves by, 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 by uh, laughing at all my terrible jokes. Um, Searles is my real name, uh, at Searles. They, my parents were, were prescient. They included the at. They were very on brand. Very useful for the 21st century. This is my actual face. Uh, you might see it on the internet tweeting snarky stuff. Uh, unfortunately, it's also my actual hairline. Uh, but, but you know, I'm an honest and open individual. Uh, I co-founded an agency called Test Double. Um, you know, we're a software agency. It's a lot like consulting, but but actually good. Uh, and we're like Nick mentioned, we're on a mission to fix what's broken about the software industry. And how we work is our our agents we pair with. Engineers like you on your team, uh, helping to give a little bit more slack into your system so that we can also make broad-based improvements to, 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 your, to your code, to your business. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's why I travel around and talk, because, because we want to find new, new clients to work with, new people to work with. So yeah, how to scratch an itch. You might infer from the intro that this is a talk about creativity. And who doesn't like creativity? It's really good, right? Everyone's on board with creativity. Until you ask, so what exactly is creativity, right? It's not something we're forced to think about a whole lot. Uh, you know, is creativity passion? You know, that might be the first thing to come in mind. Or passion's really hot right now. You get people talking about passion projects and getting people excited about doing side projects and other stuff that they really care about. Um, and of course, you know, I only get on board with a movement like this once brands start to engage with it. Uh, so you have the American Express hashtag passion project. But the thing about passion is that it tends to fizzle out because it's such a like you know a core emotion, sort of like domain name registration. Uh, so if you go to Amex's passion project, it literally isn't there anymore, which I think is, helps make my point that passion's uh, not really what creativity is all about. You could say creativity is art, and certainly art is creative. Uh, so is uh, uh, you know programming is creative, right? We like to think of what we do as a creative exercise. Um, you know, but when I look at most of the code that I write, it's not necessarily all art. So it's probably kind of an inapt metaphor for creativity. Some people might think creativity is vision, like you look into your crystal ball and you predict where the cloud goes and then where is it going to go. Um, but vision is not enough because you have to actually make something that's going to last longer. It's not just prognostication. So I thought about this and I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought, you know, if, if, if I just framed it this way and gave you a little checklist to ask yourself, are you a creative type? You know, are you passionate about your craft? Are, do you create beautiful things and can you see into the future? You know, I wouldn't check a single one of those boxes, and I doubt many of you would too. And so the popular conception of creativity is a very high bar. It would, it, it, it would befuddle me who would identify themselves as creative because it's so seemingly magical and impossible. And so that's not good. Um, you know, I think a lot of us can at least relate to the idea of a creative spark, right? And so the popular notion of a creative spark is you're walking around someday, you have an idea in the back of your head, and then you, you effortlessly emit amazing things out the other end is, is what people tend to think about. But my experience with creative sparks is actually like very different. Like I'll get one and then I'll just get incredibly stressed. I'll, I'll worry like I won't be able to do this. That's, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt settle in. And I, I, I wonder where does the creative spark come from? Does it come from a big dragon who shoots shooting fireballs at me? Should I be running? Am I going to burn up if I don't follow it? And they actually stress me out. And so I was thinking about my own fraught relationship with creativity uh, you know, for this talk. And I, and I thought, like, let's reframe it. Let's lower that bar. And here's a way to do it. You know, for, forced to answer the question, what is creativity? I would say creativity is a chronic illness. Uh, <laughs> And you might feel horrified that that's a terrible thing to say. And uh, hear me out. I have some thought behind this. What happens to me is I'll go a month without creating anything. And then all of a sudden, I'll feel all pent up and angry about stuff. And then I'll emit an NPM module. And then I'll feel a sense of relief. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll have an episode of creativity, just, just like it was a chronic illness. Um, and what happens, what my process looks like is, you know, I have all these negative energy, negative emotions like dwelling inside of me, and it goes through some tumult, and then positive outcomes manage to come out the other end. And the story of my career is that I've been able to steer the ship into a less cynical, more productive way, uh, uh, inch by inch over the course of my uh, professional life. And certainly, that lowers the bar, right? Anyone's, we've all got negative emotions. If that's all it takes, then we, anyone can be creative. 
Uh, you know, if I zoom back at the beginning of my career and try to figure out how I got to this point, uh, you know, I started in a really like buttoned up workplace, uh, and I'd have a whole lot of ideas, but I didn't have the self-actualization or the competence to actually execute on them. And so I began to associate creative ideas with my own inability to exercise them. Uh, and, and so the idea bummed me out, and that's an unhealthy relationship with creativity. In fact, the ideas would pass like they do, and I'd feel a sense of relief, uh, to, like a migraine had just passed. Um, and it took me years to realize that the root cause was that I needed an outlet. I needed a creative outlet for myself. And I realized that production servers at my, at my job at the time, they, they weren't the best creative outlet. You know, we think of ourselves as programmers, we're building stuff, we're implementing ideas creatively. Uh, you know, maybe we're making a report for somebody or a mailer to users or a, a shopping bag for people buying stuff. But even though we create it, it's typically not our own stuff on our own terms. It's not necessarily that we're building our ideas. So it doesn't match perfectly with what I think is like an edifying creative action. Also, you know, very often we're on teams, and so, you know, there's me and there's my team. And how teams work is very different than creative work because you have to go out of your way to build things consistently and, and, and in a straightforward way where everyone can understand. And if I have a creative idea on a team's code base and I say, hey, you know what? I could pull this package out. That would eliminate the need for these two packages. And then I could use a factory pattern to loop back here, and I just saved a whole bunch of time. And now I'm really happy and proud of myself. But from their perspective where they're sitting, I just upset the apple cart, and now everything is looking like it's going to fall down. And I'm just mad at them because, hey, I want you to appreciate this cool thing I just did, which makes them angry because now I'm, you know, I've gone off the reservation. And so teams don't necessarily uh, comport very well with what, what is often a very individual creative exercise. Additionally, it, it, creativity, I get my emotions wrapped up in what I'm building. So I build something in development, and I'm super proud of it. I push it off to other people in the organization, um, and, and then it sits in QA. Maybe it doesn't go into production right away. I start to get nervous, and then time passes, and maybe, maybe my thing just never ships, which makes me angry because my emotions were all wrapped up in this cool thing I did, and now it's not going to see the light of day. And I realized I have to be very careful not to cede control of my happiness to somebody else because I'm, I'm basically giving them uh, uh, you know, control of my emotional state state, and whether things go well or poorly is out of my hands, and I don't want that. So I had to find a way, whoa, to create space for creativity. <laughs> uh, so one morning, uh, you know, I was taking a shower, and I had an idea. And uh, uh, you know, like usual, like at this point, ideas make me angry. Uh, so, so this idea made me so angry, I actually did something about it. I sat at the computer, hacked on stuff. Uh, and then uh, you know, I, I, I made something. And I, I felt that sense of relief, but it was deeper and it was more substantive. Uh, and, and I got kind of addicted to this feedback loop. In fact, when I went back to work, uh, you know, I went from completely disgruntled to merely gruntled. Uh, and uh, I was able to kind of get by. So then I got into this habit of, and still to this day, I get a lot of ideas in the shower, and now I'll roll my eyes because I was like, well, there goes Saturday, because uh, uh, I'm going to just be at my computer the whole time. But at least now I, ha I have a disciplined approach to creating new stuff, and we're going to talk about that today. Because normally, you know, all of us are used to, like if we're professional programmers, we have a main project that we work on. I found it to be really healthy, whether it's at work on, in office time or, or in my spare time, to have a side project so that I can be getting my creative juices flowing and, and keeping myself fed and keep learning new stuff. Um, but it, it comes with the risk of sometimes, you know, I know this is, per, I'm talking about my experience, I tend to burn the candle at both ends. Uh, I'm, I'm really burnt out most of the time. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, and so, so, so in doing this, I was asking myself, like, why am I giving a keynote at a conference? Like, what is really different about me? Uh, or what are the preconditions that got me here? And I sat and I thought about it, and I was sort of embarrassed to realize that a lot of it had to do with my upbringing. Uh, so I'm going to tell three little anecdotes right now. The first one is about golf. My, my dad was a, a, actually an amateur golfer. I got to see when I was like four years old my dad play golf on TV, like on a PGA event. And I was like, holy crap. Like, this is really impressive. Uh, uh, and it meant that everybody in southeastern Michigan who was like a successful businessman wanted my dad in their foursome. And so I spent a lot of time at country clubs and clubhouses surrounded by kids who were much more affluent than me, had knew so much more about the world than I did, had everything more together. And I learned the very valuable trait of inadequacy from that. <laughs> uh, 
a little bit about my experience at church. I went to a church as a kid that wasn't necessarily working in the community. It was, again, a, a more affluent church where it was more heady and theological. You know, it wasn't people, like, trying to just get by. Instead, they were teaching me as a five- to seven-year-old, like, how to understand an, an intangible concept and pick an a, a opinion and then argue it with, like, firm rhetoric really passionately. And it was from, from that experience that I, I learned the very important character trait of indignation uh, now, I can't help but have an opinion about everything that I encounter in my life, uh, which is really fun. Uh, uh, also, a little bit about my college experience. I'm one of those people who has a uh, four-year computer science degree, uh, but it turned out that I was really bad at, at computer science. I was really bad. Uh, uh, all of my professors, as I was graduating, were, pulled me aside and said, you know, maybe you should consider some sort of hybrid role where you're not really trusted with a computer at work. Uh, and uh, I barely graduated. Uh, and it was from this that I really had imbued in me a strong, overwhelming sense of incompetence. Uh, and, and you look at all of those, and what do they lead to? Well, the inadequacy gave me a bunch of people to imitate in my life, templates, people to aspire to. Indignation means I always have something to say. It's a core motivator. And the incompetence means that I'm not, I don't think of myself as some rock star. I feel like I always have a ton of room to improve. And when it comes to creative work, it means I have the means, the motive, and the opportunity to, to, to do new stuff and change my circumstance. Um, also here, you know, I just have to mention, like, my background is not like everyone else's background. Like, I had the luxury of a ton of free time as a kid to be overwhelmed with existential grief. And that's not something that a lot of people uh, have to deal with. Certainly, we can't expect it of everyone. But regardless of where people come from, I've had such an overwhelmingly positive experience uh, at mitigating a lot of the negativity in my life through creative work that um, at Test Double, our company, we're trying to build a place where creativity is, is welcomed, it's, it's valued, and we bake it in by working at a sustainable pace by encouraging people to pursue this stuff in a congruent way with their work. So if you're at a job right now and your creativity isn't being fostered uh, and you, you, you don't get a chance to really exercise this stuff, uh, I'd strongly urge you to consider talking to us about how we work. Uh, if you email join at testdouble.com, we'll interview you and talk to you about you know, how we work and, and whether or not you might be a good fit for, for you and your career. So you take all three of those things, and they're all really negative. So what does that have to do with creative ideas, and how do the creative ideas form, and, and, and what do they look like? Well, for me, it's kind of like a game of Mad Libs, I think. You know, like I feel some kind of righteous indignation, but I don't know actually how to do anything about it. So maybe if I build something, I'll feel less inadequate, is, this, is the sentence that, that this is my user story uh, in my head. <laughs> so first, I want to tell a few stories about my own incompetence. Um, uh, uh, little projects I did to lessen that. What I said when I was in college, I wasn't very good at book learning, uh, and so that made me even more worried that I would never be able to get a job as a professional programmer to make money. Uh, I'm paying for this college. Why would anyone pay me? Uh, and I worked uh, uh, at my college library, and they came to me one day and said, hey, we need a new free web-based citation editor. Uh, would you be willing to build this for us for $10 an hour? And I, I took them up on the opportunity because I thought, you know, you know, I feel like I don't need all this computer science stuff that I don't understand, but I also don't know how to create my own apps either. So maybe if I take this chance, I'll at least find a way to navigate survival in this profession. And so I built this thing called Night Sight. Uh, it's a citation and bibliography engine. And I was really proud. It worked. Um, you know, some accomplishments. It supported all three major style guides. It was the only one to do it for free. Uh, dozens of types of sources. It had a co full account system. You could register and reset password. It had a bibliography creation and export. Uh, ultimately, over the years, it's gotten millions of users. That was really cool. And I, I, I made it all up as I went. I didn't really have a lot of guidance. I just had to figure things out, which led to some very minor downsides, like it's totally insecure. Uh, all of the testing was 100% manual. It produces gigabytes of server warnings every day that they just pipe to dev null. Uh, and it was one 16,000 line long PHP file. <laughs> so I learned absolutely nothing from all the computer science. It was just a string concatenation of ifs and else's. But what I realized in hindsight, of course, is that the reason I sucked at computer science was I had this fear of not doing everything right and not doing it well enough to get an A. And that fear of bad code, met, it, I felt paralyzed. Of course you need to practice. You need to have um, safe spaces to make a mess in order to practice, in order to get better. And building side projects for me has been one outlet for that. So that made me feel a little bit less incompetent. But I spent like years just building web applications and, you know, 
especially at the time, web applications were sort of glorified documents or like hypercard sort of things. Uh, uh, they weren't real development, or at least that, that's how my brain uh, told me, because I knew a lot of people who were like C hackers and built operating systems and stuff. And so I was like, that's not the metal. I want to get close to the metal as a developer. I tried to go native. And so what happened is I, I'd go and I'd pull up Xcode every now and then, and I'd look at their documentation, and I'd get really confused and feel stupid, and then I'd wait a week, and I'd open up some more documentation, try to learn some more, and I wouldn't know how to use it, and I'd feel dumb, and another week would go by. And I'd do this, I'd fall into this pattern of, of every time I tried, I tried to learn it top down, and I just felt like you know maybe I was just too dumb to build native apps. Um, but then one day, uh, you know, a momentous day occurred, and the the, uh, the original iPhone was announced. And it was at this time I was like, wow, now I really want to figure out how to build native apps because this is just going to clearly this is what the future is. But I had no idea how to do that or even what I would want to build. And so I bought the first iPhone, and I looked at it, and you could see it was obviously beautiful and innovative. I could see from the first moment, like, I'm ignoring all the people in my life, and this is taking away precious moments from me. And so I could tell right from the jump it was life-altering. Uh, and it was also impossibly slow. And so like, I had this web forum that I like to visit, but it was illegible, because there's no mobile web. Uh, and it was really slow. It took like three minutes to load a page. There's no mobile web, so like, it wasn't like, we didn't know how to format that on the server side, and I didn't control it anyway. There was no responsive design. And so I thought to myself, maybe I could build an app for that. And so like, maybe, you know, like, obviously the mobile web at that point was a joke, but I kept failing to learn how to build native apps. So maybe if I would like, really go and try to build a client for this website, I'd learn how to learn stuff. Uh, and so what I did was uh, I just built a little app piece by piece. First, I download the HTML. Then I figured out how to include libxml2 to parse the HTML uh, into some objects. Uh, I'd go and find where all the locations of the other media, like images on the page were, go fetch those, and then build a custom user interface that looked something like that. And I succeeded. It was, it was significantly faster. I could read it. It was full featured. You could, you could edit posts, create posts, log in, and so forth. It was also my very first open source contribution to a major project. And so every time anyone with an iPhone launched the Facebook app, a little bit of my code ran. And that just made me addicted. It made me realize like, I could have, even if I'm not getting credit for it, like an impact on the world. And it was also the very first time I ever gave a talk was explaining how I'd learned this framework. Uh, those are all upsides. One downside was that the app was rejected by Apple, and I threw it in the trash. Because, because at the time, the, the review guidelines were really prudish, and people might say a swear on the internet. Uh, so, so that was a, kind of a waste of work. But I didn't care. I was happy. My mission was accomplished. I was there to learn how to learn. Uh, and, and I succeeded. And, and what I learned in retrospect is like learning simple stuff is easy if you can fit it inside of like a day. Because like, back to passion, maybe, maybe that's enough to get you over whatever hump you need to get through it. But if you're learning something bigger that's going to take multiple days or weeks to get, get, get through your head, then you need to find something that has like a real purpose that's going to drive you past all the obstacles that you hit. Otherwise, you'll get sucked into other stuff and, and you'll only ever half finish it. And so I, I, I really believe in like that. The, the value of indignation, right, is like I care mad about stuff just enough to force myself to get through when I want to learn a new technology. So that helped reduce my incompetence. Um, the, the third thing is I was at the time a professional Java developer, uh, uh, and I felt like Java was a little nerdy, certainly uncool, and at the time all my friends were programming Ruby, and they were really cool, and I wanted to be like them. And if I look back and compare the two languages, uh, it reminded me of Super Mario Kart, like the original one, where like, the, Java felt like the early courses, the really wide lanes, like you, could, you couldn't really cause that much trouble. If you like, drove off, the compiler would put you back on, you had static types, you had all these stuff to help you. Uh, it wasn't very expressive. Ruby felt more like Rainbow Road, right? It's a narrow, <laughs> narrow track, and you, if you fall off, you die, uh, and you get pulled way back. And all of Ruby's like duct typing, dyna dynamism, metaprogramming, all that stuff made it feel so much like sharp and scary to me. And I was already not very confident about my ability to program anything, much less dynamic programming like Ruby, much less what was popular at the time, metaprogramming, like at runtime, changing the definition of objects and classes. So I was on my first Ruby team, horrified, around all these cool people who are way smarter than me. And I started looking around, and then I looked at their tests. And I realized that their tests sucked. Like, coming from Java, I'd learned a lot about testing, and I thought Rubyists were really great at it, too. Uh, and I saw a lot of tests like this. Like, this is uh, creating a fake dog with RSpec mocks. 
Uh, and then you, know, you could say the dog should be called with the, the method wag with the argument tail. And then I call the thing under test and I pass it the dog, and that's the test. But there were a lot of problems with this to me. First of all, it wasn't aware of a dog type, and so it didn't test whether or not dog actually had the method wag or that it took one argument. Uh, it was out of order. You normally expect tests to go given, win, then, and this is given, then, win. Uh, and the API was verbose and awkward and like easy to forget. And so I looked at that and I got care mad about that little thing off to the side. And I decided, you know, hey, what if like, given that our, Ruby's like mocks suck, it, I don't know how to metaprogram Ruby, but if I could figure that out, then maybe I'd finally fit in with all these Rubyists. Uh, and my goal here was just to cargo cult the stuff that I'd learned from Java uh, to Ruby and literally just drop and make my own little mocking library and make a name for myself. And that did not go great. Um, I, uh, I had to learn humility here because I had to go and actually engage with Ruby thought leaders and programmers to understand the idioms and conventions of Ruby. Uh, I had to read up and understand Ruby's object model, and I had to spend a lot of time. I took two weeks off work at Christmas, and all I did was work on this library. And where I landed was a little tool called Gimme. So I could say, hey, give me a new dog, uh, pass it to my subject, and then verify that the dog was called with wag and the argument tail. Uh, and this fit all my criteria. It was, I preserved the test order, the terse API was kind of clever and cute. Of course, nobody adopted it, because nobody knew who I was, uh, but I would show it to people at conferences, and I was able to influence people like Jim Wyrick, who incorporated it into FlexMock, and ultimately now our spec mocks, that first library, years later, has the same style supported. Uh, so I like to think that I kind of moved the needle a little bit. And most importantly for me professionally, where I was at the time, I learned a lesson that like, if I'm, uh, uh, this was the thing that I was worried about most was fitting in and understanding metaprogramming. And the way that I dealt with it was dealing with the least important thing on the project. I didn't want to get in the way of the most important stuff, because uh, then it would be obvious I was an imposter. But I had this thing off to the side that I could iterate on in a safe space. And I learned too that like, I might have been able to complain about those tests, but then I would have just been a complainer. But if I throw a keyboard at it and I actually build something, I was able to sell those ideas to the team and better articulate them myself. And the best thing about ideas is that they don't require any maintenance. No one opens up GitHub issues against my terrible ideas in the middle of the night. Uh, nobody comes to depend and rely on them. And so uh, it's true, thought leaders have more fun. So that made me feel significantly less incompetent because I was able to language jump for the first time. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about how I dealt with my own sense of inadequacy. I practice a thing called Midwestern programming. Um, it, you know, this is, uh, you might be familiar, this is the Uni United States, the continental United States of JavaScript. And what I like to think is like on the East Coast, people have very impressive looking like engineering jobs. It, there's a lot of sciences, a lot of math, a lot of finance, a lot of university work. And so what you do is just obviously uh, fascinating and interesting and, and impressive. Meanwhile, on the West Coast with all the startups are all the apps that everyone's ever heard of. Uh, it's really popular, really cool. You can relate to people really easily. But in the Midwest, and because we're in Nebraska, I will expand my definition of the Midwest. Um, <laughs> We do a lot of back office stuff that's proprietary, and maybe the UX is just for a handful of people, uh, and it's really hard to explain. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm really not good at cocktail parties when I try to explain how we worked on uh, uh, you know, the smart energy system in South Africa and, and how demand response works, you know, that kind of thing. So I had some rock star envy. I just wanted to build something cool and show that I could fit in with others. So I felt like you know, my work wasn't exciting, but I only had experience in building enterprise apps. So maybe if I built something intentionally to go viral, I'd feel more appreciated. I'd certainly at least be better at cocktail parties. This guy named Aiden Feldman wrote a thing called Mustacheify Me, where you could pass in an image, and it would uh, affix a mustache on top of the image. And I thought that was pretty cool, and I wondered maybe there's a way for me to integrate. Like, let's think bigger. What could something I build on top of that look like? So, so I built a uh, Chrome extension called Mustache, and uh, I built it with my friend Corey, and how it worked is it would go and find all the images on the page and then go to Mustacheify Me and replace all the images with what Mustacheify returned. And this was really fun. We, we posted to a forum at like 11 at night, went to bed, Got up in the morning, had 3,000 installs, realized that people in general hit about 40 tabs an hour, and the average tab has 42 images on it, which totaled up in just the first night to about 5 million requests per hour. Uh, and we were thought leaders at the time, this is years ago, but we were pioneers in uh, serverless architecture because <laughs> we totally destroyed that, that Heroku dino. Um, so we had to go back to the drawing board, and we went to the source. Now, face.com was an API that you could hit, and it would give you JSON back to say where the faces in the page were. And that meant that we had to bring our own mustache, and then we'd be able to like, twist and turn it and uh, apply it to the faces ourselves. 
So many months pass. I mean, that was a fun week, right? It was a cute thing to do. I got a little bit of attention, but whatever. Forgot about it, months pass. I see in the, in the news that face.com was bought for 80 million bucks from Facebook. And I was like, whoa, that's impressive. So I started Googling around to see about my mustache thing, because it, it was actually serverless. I had no idea that a lot of people were using it. I looked, Tested had done an article on it. PC World had done an article about it, even in print. Uh, the Verge did an article on it. Glamour Magazine even did an article on it. It had hundreds of thousands of users generating billions upon billions of requests every day. Um, and that made me feel really good. And then I thought about it and I realized, like, wait a second, like, the face.com people, like, their developer support forums were mostly people using my plugin, and they were providing free support to them. Wouldn't they, like, it's violating the terms of service. Why would they want that? And then I thought, oh, right, they just sold their thing for $80 million because they hockey sticked. They were able to show off all this usage that was probably partly due to my mustache thing. Uh, and then I, all these, this email started flooding in because, of course, face.com got shut down. And it wasn't fan mail. It was people who were angry that their browsers no longer worked. Um, uh, and none of the images were loading. And so I learned some stuff. I built a popular thing, but I was totally unaware. I didn't benefit from that popularity at all. Uh, I might have made somebody else for all I know millions of dollars, citation needed, but that's how I feel. Uh, <laughs> and if we've le learned one thing in this election year, how you feel is what matters. Um, <laughs> I made thousands of people angry, but I was left with no recourse to help them, uh, you know, because I didn't control everything that was going on. I certainly didn't have the time to build a new facial recognition thing for my mustache toy. Um, so I learned a couple things, like serverless isn't. You're, if you're depending on somebody else's servers and they take them away, your thing breaks, and you have to think about that. Uh, also, that it's just chasing after popularity without providing people real value that you could support in a sustainable way is really vapid. Like once that went away, I just was more depressed than I started with because all I'd done was like, you know, make a lot of people angry at me. Um, nevertheless though, I did build a cool thing and I got to be on the verge, so that was cool. Uh, so I felt slightly less inadequate. Another time, I was on a long waterfall project. It was a legacy rescue project. If you don't know that term, uh, legacy means that your kids will inherit it. Uh, and rescue means that you want to be rescued. So uh, I was on this project for a long time, feeling really bad. I was just imagining, like, trying to remember what it was like to code, and I couldn't remember what it was like to write code. And I asked myself, could I even program anything useful in two months anymore? Uh, and so at the time, it was during the golden renaissance of to-do applications. Uh, and I had a whole bunch of them, but I hated all of them. I just kept falling back to my own plain text style, where I'd list them off with dashes, and then as I finished them, I'd cross them off or mark them high priority or, or defer them to another date. And it was just in my head. It wasn't an app. But I felt, you know, at the time, I hated all those to-do apps that were more highfalutin, but I forgot how to code. So maybe if I built my own little thing, you know, I'd at least restore my sense of self-worth and dignity as a developer. Uh, so I, what I did was I kind of gave myself an intentional quest. Uh, I was like, I want to build such a great to-do app, I would actually use it and rely on it every day at the exclusion of all the others. And I only wanted to give myself 24 hours. Could I really hack it? And so I built this thing called Doing It. Um, uh, you know, I started by making a div content editable, dumping whatever you type into local storage, reset it, read it from local storage on page reloads, uh, and then from that moment forward, I was able to bootstrap it and actually build doing it, using doing it to track doing it, and that was a lot of fun. I did it. Uh, it's still up, actually. It's still online. It somehow still works. Uh, as you make projects with colon and dash, uh, it, it picks up that it's a task. Uh, and then you can go and finish them with slash or set dates in the future and due dates come out yellow. And it's still where it's fun. It's, it's a toy, but I still use it every now and then. I was proud of the fact I finished it in one day. It gave me a renewed sense of confidence. Uh, it still work, works running on a free Heroku dyno. Thanks, Heroku. It has no users, which, you know, whatever. But at least it doesn't mean I have anyone who's angry emailing me. Um, and I just threw it up on GitHub when I was done. The purpose of that one was just self-validation. I just wanted to build something for myself to prove that I could still hack it. Um, you know, open source maintainers, we get asked a lot by people who want to get into open source, you know, how do, how do, I, how do I break in? And, you know, we could say, go build 200 things, uh, and then maybe something will get lucky. But typically, when, when, when rock star maintainers are asked this, they say stuff like, well, you know, write me some docs, you know, or uh, send, send me a pull request. And that's the typical advice that folks get. But when you actually do that and give that maintainer a doc, like a, like a pull request, say, the most likely reaction you're going to get out of maintainers, because we're just 
there to create our own stuff and not necessarily f fantastic uh, community organizers, will get angry and say, wait a second, I'm going to reject this because this isn't how I would do it and just give you back a whole lot of critical feedback, uh, totally discouraging the thing that you set out to do. And so like, if you want another boss in your life than just sending pull requests and hoping that's going to be your path into the open source world is, is, is maybe a good idea. Uh, but personally, if you ask a lot of maintainers how they got into open source, they'll probably tell you, I just made stuff I wanted, and then I flung it on the internet. And, and I just kept doing it. And you'll never know what sticks. Like, if you look at my uh, between Testable and my Searles account and my other orgs, I have over 200 repos that I've started. And you've probably, if you've heard of any of them, you've probably only heard of like three or four. And, and so, so that just took a lot of uh, uh, spaghetti at the wall. But nevertheless, anyway, back to the point, building something for myself in under a day made me feel less inadequate. Now I'm in this role, I'm in a weird role of being kind of like a thought leader. Um, and what happens with thought leaders, I've met, met a lot of speakers, it starts usually with them doing some interesting work. Uh, they share their insights with others. Then they stop doing the work. Uh, and then you run this risk, because you're too far from the work now, that you just thought lead other people off a cliff. Uh, and, and, and that isn't good. Um, you know, I talk a lot about test-driven development. Uh, one day I started leading some thoughts on test-driven development. Uh, in fact, you can find the article I wrote if you Google TDD failure, uh, I'm the top result, this article. And, uh, uh, you know, I was excited to share with the world, like, hey, this is a different way of thinking. This is called London School TDD. And then the guy who actually invented that responded, wait a second, actually, no, you've deviated quite a lot and you're doing this other thing. And this article got to the top of Hacker News and I was so excited, but I was like, oh, shoot, I was totally wrong. Uh, I just, I just was, I gave people a bunch of really bad advice. But then I pivoted and decided I'm just going to name it my own thing now. Uh, so, so I'd market this thing as discovery testing. And then I went around the world uh, at conferences trying to teach people uh, this, this type of TDD that I practiced to try to like, you know, uh, uh, get some traction. But I realized that I'd been talking about it a lot more than doing it. I'd become a talking head. And so I felt like, you know, it's true, TDD still isn't very well understood or well practiced in most places. But I, I'm too far from the work at this point. I can't really validate that my ideas are um, uh, actually going to be successful if somebody just takes my advice, and that's not fair. So one weekend I was thinking, I've got this Simply Safe alarm system. You know, you just uh, you subscribe and it monitors, and then the cops come if your alarm goes off. And I like uh, Apple's HomeKit. I want everything in my home to be on HomeKit. So I run this node server called HomeBridge on my Mac Mini. And I was thinking I could just build an adapter for Simply Safe, and, and so that you know, from my couch I could say, hey Siri, turn on the alarm, and save myself the eight seconds of getting up. And so then I spent like 40 hours on a node module, um, <laughs> which is just what programmers tend to do. So, so looking at this, I did not know how to build this, but I was like, discovery testing is all about building things that you don't know how to do. Does it work? Does my process work? And will I practice it? And a few hours later, uh, it did work. And it was pretty successful. You can actually go and install the module. It's called Simply Safe. Uh, and what happens is you just require it. You pass it some credentials. Uh, you get a client back. And then you can tell the client, like, change the state of the system. And because I test drove all of it, it was really funny because now I had all these tests that had the uh, uh, accidental potential of bringing the cops to my house. Uh, uh, and I work in the basement, and I wouldn't have heard them, and so uh, that, that took some great care in how I designed the test suite. Um, but the, 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 the activity was fun, right? Like, I followed my own advice. It actually went really well, but it was shameful at the same time, because I went so long without validating my ideas that that was unfair to all the people I was speaking to. It was taking advantage of the platform that I'd been given. So if you're a technical manager in the room, especially if you're a former developer, the only advice that I have to share with you is, like, at a distance, everything seems very simple. Like, oh, that'll only take three weeks. But then if you're the developer on it, you're in the weeds, you're going to see all the problems and all the foibles, and everything is much more complex, and we have to account for that. Additionally, humans are pattern recognition machines. And if you're more experienced and you've seen 100 projects before, you start to build up this like, list of kind of generic advice that's highly polished and generally applicable, but is never a perfect fit for any specific context. And so to people who are in a role where they're sharing stuff with others, you have to understand that like, you have to trust the people closest to the work. If, you're, if your advice doesn't fit, you have to respect that and assume that they're you know, high-functioning adults who, who did learn their level best, and maybe it's your advice that needs to be adjusted. So that coming full circle made me feel less inadequate because I was like worried that I was kind of just like a hot air balloon of, of, of opinions, uh, and it kind of helped reground me. Now I want to talk about a few projects uh, about dealing with my own indignation. So I'm a big worrier. Um, uh, if you can't tell, I'm super anxious all the time. 
Uh, I, I worry about my finances, about my bank, and about my credit cards, and like what the state of them is. I worry about my retirement savings. And so uh, I always wanted a personal financial dashboard that would just tell me at a glance, is everything OK? And for a long time, I used a product called Mint. And there's a lot of these dashboards that do this. Uh, and when I had that dashboard, it made me feel safe and secure, because I could see where all, all my assets were and all my debt. Uh, so a lot of years passed, and I, I just out of the blue was thinking, you know, like, I wonder, really, how does Mint work? Like, how is that secure? That would be, seem to be hard to do. Uh, and I thought a little harder about it, and then I realized, oh, it's not secure, is how it's secure. Uh, it's just holding on to decryptable versions of all of my passwords all in one place. And it's actually a really popular cloud um, uh, uh, infrastructure pattern right now. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to start this as a meme called Spafass, uh, single point of failure as a service. Uh, so. <laughs> If, if Mint or Yodely gets hacked, now all of your finances can get drained all at once uh, instead of them having to figure out uh, uh, each of them individually. So I stewed on this for a while, and a few weeks passed, and I was like, I got to do something about this. I got to close Mint. I got to get off this. And so I thought, you know, I feel like security matters, but I don't want to be an expert. I don't want to have to figure out how to scale this. Maybe if I build it, I'll just feel a little bit safer. And so I wrote a library called Finance. Um, and what finance does is you pass it an adapter and then your credentials. It even supports, uh, because you can run from a terminal, it even supports two-factor auth. So it opens up a browser with Selenium, and then it gives you back all of your account holdings, uh, uh, adapter by adapter. And that enabled me to write a, a, a Rails app called Finance App. And you run it locally, uh, and it's, uh, uh, yeah, so it's at local host. That means you can encrypt the database itself, and then you can take snapshots. And in the background, browsers will load up and pull down all of your assets, uh, and it's just as secure as it would be from your browser. Uh, so, so I almost have that dashboard that I want. It's locally encrypted, which is much more safe than Mint. Uh, it puts Selenium to good use, uh, uh, other than just testing. Uh, but it's not a generalizable app. It's not built for scale. You can, you can clone it and run it yourself if you like. And I did actually contract a little bit of cloud paranoia. I'm now thinking about all the services I use, and that's just unhealthy, because in this day and age, you just kind of have to like, let go of your privacy. But I remembered there at that moment that like, there's no shame in hobby-grade stuff. You know, looking back, a lot of us got into programming because we built selfish little toy apps that just only solved our immediate problem. Uh, and, and doing that is still good practice. So that, that helped soothe a little bit of my indignation. Another one, uh, so my company's name is Test Double. I'm going to talk about Test Doubles a little bit. If you're not familiar with the term, that example earlier, Gimme, is an example of a Test Double library. Uh, the nature of the term is like uh, it's meant to evoke the image of like stunt doubles, except for like a plane. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a thing that stands in for a real thing in your test. So if you're writing a test that depends on the cloud and you fake the cloud out uh, to make your test pass, you just created a Test Double of that cloud service. Sign-on is by far the most popular test double library for JavaScript today. It gets like 1.7 million downloads a month. But when I see people use it, a lot are confused, a lot get frustrated, and a lot are angry or just don't understand how, 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 how good testable usage looks. Uh, and I've thought a lot about this problem in the past and other environments, uh, and I wanted to help solve it. So I felt like users in JavaScript with test double stuff were in pain, but I wasn't going to beat sign-on. I wasn't going like, to get a, a million seven uh, uh, downloads a month. And so it didn't feel like it was worth it. But maybe if I built it, at least I'd be less grouchy and le look less cynical when I complained. Uh, so, so it was at this point that I realized, like, you know, it's very possible my entire career is going to hinge on just two or three concepts. I keep going back to that well over and over again. And I think that's actually good. I learn about something. I build stuff. I talk about it. I learn more. And I'm able to iterate. And I go deeper and deeper. And that's, I think, how I develop expertise. And it's very possible that, like, test doubles won't even be a thing by the time I retire. Uh, but it's useful right now. So I built a thing called testdouble.js. Uh, the whole reason I really did this was I wanted to think of a way that I could squat on the name of uh, the NPM name for test double, because I didn't want somebody else to swoop in and take my company NPM name. Uh, uh, so you can install it that way. And I don't have time to teach anything about it today, but if you'd like to, I've got a 20-minute screencast uh, at that short URL called Happy Your TDD that shows off the library and why I think it has some advantages. Or if you'd rather read, I've put up a blog post uh, called TD versus sign-on uh, with, with the particular side-by-side -side comparison of how you use them. So testdouble.js, you know, it works pretty well in our opinion. Uh, it shares the lessons that we've learned pretty clearly, I think, and help teach people proper mocking and stubbing use. And it's clearly better than just being cynical. 
Early on, I learned that like, if my message isn't getting through to people and I conclude that it's obviously the listener's fault for not understanding what I'm saying, I'm left with no options. Ba basically, at that point, all I can really do is disengage and, and fail. But if I conclude that like, maybe I can tweak my message uh, and keep iterating on how I communicate it, maybe I'll win more and more people over. And only as a last resort will I ever think it's something with the listener that's not getting conveyed my message. Um, and so, even though I wasn't in a position to win in this case, I didn't feel like it was a worth, uh, worthless activity. It was still worthwhile because it could make a point and win over some of the people some of the time, even if they're just my team or just a few friends here and there. Also, criticism is easier than, than contribution, and I'm very cognizant of the fact that I just complain on Twitter all day, and I feel like this might be kind of part of my penance, <laughs> is trying to make things at least a little bit better as I go. So that soothed some of my indignation, at least with JavaScript. One last one. You might notice I use a lot of emoji. I like emoji. They're fun. It's a quick, easy way to convey, convey how something makes you feel. And uh, uh, creativity is really serious work. It can be really draining. If you do a lot of open source, the motto is like, you create, we depend. Uh, uh, you, know, you might have an idea. You might build something. It might make you really happy. Uh, it brings you a lot of joy. But then a company adopts it, and they start acting like entitled jerks, asking for your work, for, for your labor for free, and it bums you out. And I see a lot of maintainers who end up hating their own creations in proportion with how popular they are, which seems backwards. So at the time when I was thinking this, I felt really exploited and exhausted, uh, but I couldn't escape it because my whole career had been so tied up in open source, I wasn't just going to rage quit and delete all my repos. So maybe if I built something fresh, I'd find a fresh start and I'd, I'd feel recharged. And, and so uh, I set out to build something that no business would ever want. <laughs> and uh, even now, when I'm, when I'm doing something I think might get exploited, I'll just GPL it uh, a little, uh, uh, almost as like as a, as a troll to companies to be like, hey, if you really want to use this, you have to come to me first and, and obtain a license. Uh, so it's like opt in on my part. And I built this thing called Emo Ruby. Uh, it's a, there aren't very many transpilers for Ruby, but this is a uh, an emoji to Ruby transpiler. Uh, uh, here's a little bit of Emo Ruby. So here's a class. I'm defining a method and printing out some statement, and ending those things. Then I instantiate the class. Uh, so the the Ruby. A transpile down looks like this. So yeah, if you read Emo Ruby, that's pretty obvious, of course. Emo Ruby, it's real dumb, S super dumb, real. No, no one, no one needs this. <laughs> But it brought me a lot of joy. I had a lot of fun. I got a couple other contributors, like Philip Arndt in New Zealand. We're hacking on it, and we like, you know, came up with all these fun schemes and memes. And it was a, it was a fun little game. And it definitely like, you know, showed people that, that that there can be joy in silly open source, even if you're a big serious maintainer. And my favorite part is that there haven't been any issues opened against it this year, and so it hasn't taken any work. So remind yourself, like it's okay just to build stuff for yourself. You know, uh, if you're if you're here and, and your boss isn't looking, it's actually you know it's okay to build stuff for fun. Uh, it's okay just to, to to revisit the joy that got you probably interested in programming in the first place. And certainly, activities like that help soothe my sense of indignation. And so, starting with all these really powerful and overwhelming negative feelings, uh, all of them have lessened over the years. Now, if you're here today and you're looking at me showing off all these like uh, projects that I've done, I might be accidentally re-raising the bar of, oh, that doesn't look like me. I don't do that. Keep in mind that this is like over a dozen years now of random side projects I'm sharing with you, and it's okay to start small. Um, so please don't feel bummed out. But you know, maybe you're right. Creativity isn't for everyone, surely. You know, if you're perfectly content and totally fulfilled, and you're OK with the status quo in the software industry, then why would you want to change things? I, I agree. It would be difficult to dr build any creative drive. Uh, but I don't feel like that's most of us. You know? For those people, enjoy your happiness. Uh, I have no idea what it's like to be you, uh, but I theoretically envy you very much. <laughs> Meanwhile, in, cu in culture right now, I think that we've pathologized negative emotions as being themselves bad. But I think it's worth asking, whenever we feel negatively about something, maybe it's a symptom of something else. And if you do root cause analysis when you're unhappy, maybe it's because you're using the wrong tool for the job, or there's friction between the practices you're trying to use and the technologies that you're implementing. Maybe your current job just can't offer what you need professionally at this moment in time, and you need to look elsewhere. Or maybe you just have internal baggage to get over. If you reflect on how you, if you, reflect on how you feel, 
um, and, and you accept those emotions as not themselves being bad, you can sort of feed them to your brain as ammunition. And from that, it'll just asynchronously spit out ideas. And if you listen to those ideas, then as long as you, um, uh, you know, act on them, you might find that like, you know, feeling confused, uh, feeling uh, 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 sad or angry or, or, or afraid no longer become these like paralyzing sensations. They actually can be used as fodder for figuring out new things that you could create. Uh, and then, you know, it's a low bar and it's easy to fling yourself over it at that point. And, and um, that's the message I want to share is like, you know, if you listen to yourself and then you find an outlet. And keep in mind too that even though all of my exercises here were software projects, your, your creative outlet might not have anything to do with software and that's totally okay. But I really believe everyone in this room has things that are worth creating, uh, whether or not you consider yourself a creative type. Uh, and uh, I'd love today if we took the opportunity, because I'm a visitor to your community, you guys are all stuck with each other uh, long term. I'd love today if you took the opportunity, since I'm, I'm here first, uh, use this hashtag, I made thing, uh, and just share an idea of something you'd like to create, maybe invite other people to work on it with you, or show off something that you did recently. Uh, I'd love to see the stuff, the creative stuff that's happening in this community, and most importantly, I'd like you to be able to share it with each other. Uh, uh, and if you do that on the I made thing hashtag, I'll, I'll retweet some of my favorites. Um, you know, like I said, my name's Searles. I'd love if you found me on Twitter, told me what you thought about this talk, uh, what you thought about these ideas. Uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if we're going to change this industry, we're going to need a lot of creative types. Uh, uh, I'd love if you talked to, uh, to us at Test Double about joining. And if you know any teams that are looking for great programmers, I know that not very many software companies are hiring or need more programmers. Uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you for laughing at that. Uh, uh, that's how we work. We step into that role and, and we help teams out to like, you know, accomplish stuff, get stuff done, but also make things better as we work. Um, so, you know, hey, thank you very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm.